Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome. We're so glad you could come to our last Dev Talk of the season, of the year. Um, we're excited today. Dan and Pavan from our Visibility IQ team are going to be here uh, to talk about the APIs. And I think we have some exciting information to share with you today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules. I want to go through this very quickly and then I'll turn it over to them. Um, anybody can join our developer community. We welcome you to do so. It's free. Um, there's a lot of important information on there for you, how to build our API offerings, things of that nature. And as always, you're welcome to join whenever you can. Um, we'll also have recordings of this webinar up on our YouTube uh, developer playlist. Um, we also have a couple other a couple other things. Sorry about that. That's the dog behind me. <laughs> we have a couple other things uh, that you can also subscribe to. Not only our Dev Talks, but our Dev Buzz newsletter, which is a um, monthly newsletter uh, providing you information on registrations and upcoming events, but it also gives you a, a snippet of information on um, tech tools, trends, and solutions that are some of our offerings for the developer community. So it's a really good piece of information to have on hand and you can pick and choose how you want it. Um, that comes once a month and you can register on the developer portal. At the end of our presentation today, uh, towards the end, we'll be taking questions. Uh, we'll do that instead of doing it during the presentation so we can keep it moving along, but please feel free to put your questions um, up in our question box and then I'll, I'll go ahead and ask Dan and Pavan uh, towards the end of our uh, webinar today. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, as always, please feel free to reach out to our DevRel team at developer at zebra.com. And with that, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much, Stacy. Yeah. I uh, really appreciate you having me and Pavan on here. Uh, I, I heard you say this is the last Dev Talk of the year, so great that you saved the best for last. We're really excited about this one. Um, for those folks who don't know me, uh, I actually used to work on Zebra's DevRel team. So I uh, worked with Stacy really closely for a number of years and we helped get this series going. And now I'm, I've moved over into some of our software and services products and uh, focused on uh, really enhancing a lot of the tools that we have out for uh, the developer community. So today we're here to talk about our Visibility IQ APIs. And a number of you may have been on a dev talk that Robin West hosted, I think it was in May, but could have been in early June. And she was uh, going through some uh, Zebra dev uh, mobile computer device health APIs. And if you attended that session, you're going to see that we've taken that product and we've renamed it now to this Visibility IQ API and we've doubled the size of what we have in it and we have a lot more value than what we originally had. So we're really excited to be able to showcase this. I'm gonna walk through uh, some of the overview of what the product has, and then Pavan's gonna be diving into uh, some of the more technical components, how to use the APIs, et cetera. So to kick things off, I think a number of folks have seen this diagram before when we talk about Zebra Savannah. Zebra Savannah is Zebra's cloud enablement platform that we have to better be able to connect all of Zebra's devices, our printers, mobile computers, scanners, RFID readers, et cetera, all to the cloud. And really what we're doing is we're trying to centralize and commonize that across Zebra to make the developer experience better. Now that's a developer experience internal to Zebra for our own teams as we're building out solutions, but also for you, our developer community. So as we're building our own solutions with an API first mentality, uh, we are building the APIs, some of which we're then exposing externally for you to use, and but also we're using these to build our own apps. So in this case, uh, we can look at a product Zebra has called Visibility IQ. So Visibility IQ is something that initially today is focused on our mobile computers, uh, but I think going forward, you'll see that we're, we're branching out to other products such as printing. Um, and what we do here is we actually have an agent running on every one of Zebra's mobile computer devices. So today, 
Many of you interface with our mobile computers through our EMDKs. So that's our software development kits for the mobile computers. And on that first layer, that gives you direct access to the device. And so what Zebra's done is we've built this agent, our ZDS agent. And similarly, on the print side, we've done the same thing. We have our ZPC, uh, so that's Zebra Data Services agent. Here's Zebra Printer Connector agent. But we have these agents that what they're doing, they're built off of these development kits, and they allow us to identify a lot of key components and interfaces for these devices. And then it allows us, when our customers enable it, to take that information, send it up to the cloud to centralize it, so that our customers and partners can then have access to that information. So today, every one of Zebra's Android mobile computers comes with this ZDS agent pre-installed. And when a customer enables that, it allows the data across over 250 data points on each of those devices to be aggregated into the Zebra Savannah cloud. And then, so what we're doing, we then take some of that information. We, we're collecting that, we have that historical data, and we also then do some analytics on top of that. So we, if we take a look at, you know, an example of a data point on this aggregated side could be, uh, there's a number of things around our battery. Is it actively charging? How many times has that battery been charged? What length of time? Uh, uh, what kind of discharge on the battery have there been? And then what we do on this top value add, we're, we have a number of algorithms and analytics where we are calculating different things. So for example, on the battery, we have an algorithm, remaining useful life, that gives a prediction on when that battery will no longer be able to hold a charge through a full shift for a worker. And so that's a, a great example of what this value add means. And then ultimately there's a presentation layer. And, and that's where traditionally what we've had is we've had our applications. So Visibility IQ, which is an insight platform that complements well with EMM platforms, but it goes another layer forward to give a lot more of these value-added insights around what devices you have, where they're at, what state are they in, and how they're being used. And then what should you do to better manage and enable um, those devices? Similarly, uh, Printer Profile Manager Enterprise is another application in that that's focused on the printing side. So traditionally, we've had these user interfaces, but as many of you developers know, there's a whole host of other uh, actions people are looking to do with that information besides what we've created in our own user interfaces. And that's why we have now um, pulled together the APIs into some data services products that we can uh, offer up to our developer community. And that's what we're looking at for the Visibility IQ APIs. So ultimately with Visibility IQ, uh, you can see here, there's a couple example screenshots. I have another one I'm gonna show up next, but ultimately, you know, some of the goals we have, we wanna help our customers or partners that are using this dashboard to help manage something or manage service for those customers to catch a problem before it happens. So I mentioned remaining useful life of the battery. So we want to make sure that we can have those workers ready to perform their tasks through that full shift. Um, allocating resources, this allows you to look at what should the full deployment look like, where are those devices? Where are they at different sites? And sometimes even within a site, where are they used? Then to be able to look at historical information. So if we look down to that forecast seasonal demands, you look at historical information, you can start getting at identifying patterns to be able to know where devices should be, where should you be prepped to be able to be prepared for the different things that are coming up. And because we've had these uh, traditional reports, we now have heard from a lot of our customers as well as the partner community that the data is extremely valuable, but um, for some reason or another, the user interface we've designed doesn't meet their use case. So what would some of those examples be? Well, some of those examples of uh, other use cases could involve if you have um, 
a, a customer who doesn't just use Zebra devices, uh, and they want to pull in that information of Zebra devices and combine it with information from other devices. We also have uh, customers that are looking to automate actions. So I mentioned the battery. So instead of just looking at a dashboard to identify that a battery has low remaining useful life, they may want to trigger something into a, uh, a workforce management system where you can assign a worker a task to go and pull new batteries out of stock and swap out those ones that have the low uh, remaining useful life or potentially purchase new ones. And then lastly, we, we have a number of managed service providing partners who are very interested in using some of the data involved in this system uh, to power some of their own offerings. And so that, therefore, the visibility IQ foresight dashboard that we have is not the right fit. They want to pull some of these insights directly into their own solution. So as I said, I, I wanted to show another example of uh, what our visibility IQ foresight and one care dashboards look like today. And for those who are familiar, uh, what I wanted to showcase here, this is information on repair life cycle. So when a customer takes, uh, has de devices that are sent into repair. And within each of these reports, so here you can see the graph uh, pretty clearly here, but on this, there's also a number of different tabs. And within each of these tabs, there's a host of data that we're showcasing. So if we're looking at the open orders, we're looking at which service orders they are, the repair number, uh, as well as the customer reference number, et cetera. And ultimately, what we've done for the APIs that we have, we've really done our best to have really a one-to-one -one presentation layer uh, of the API to this display. So we have a method for uh, repair lifecycle open orders that's providing all of the data that's on here. And Pavan's going to go and do a deep dive onto that to give a better example of how that works. But ultimately, we give you a lot of filters, a lot of controls, so that you can pull the data that you're looking for. You don't necessarily just need to do a full data dump of everything, but you can specify a lot of different things around the devices, around the dates, and other information that you're specifically wanting. Um, but just like I said, so there's a method for open orders. We also have others for these other tabs. There's a, a specific API method for in repair, repaired, shipped, et cetera. And Pavan will uh, walk through that a little bit. Um, but ultimately, I, I did talk about some of this already, but when we look at why are we doing this, it's companies really want to understand their deployments. And I, I would say it may be surprising to many of you, but we actually have a large number of customers. They have these large deployments. They don't actually even know their inventory. They don't know what devices they have, how many are actively being used, and where they're being used. So that's kind of a baseline of where they can start. And then looking at the actual utilization, looking at those uh, usage patterns through different seasons, uh, looking at how the devices are performing and optimizing that performance, those are really where a lot of the value comes through uh, for, for these uh, products. And I think I highlighted a number of those use cases of where the API stands out uh, for some different and additional use cases beyond the user interface we have. So another, you know, I, I really think one of the big ones there is really automating the actions that a company wants based on the insights that they're able to identify through these. So ultimately, when we look across uh, Visibility IQ Foresight, I believe we have 26 different reports. And you'll see here that we do not yet have every API that's out there, um, but we are launching with nine different APIs that directly are reflecting the reports. Um, so that's what this top layer is. And these two layers are actually reflecting, I showed before those three tiers. The bottom tier was the direct device interaction. The middle tier was us aggregating and collecting data from our agent into the cloud. And then that top layer is that value add layer. So focusing in on this, you know, ultimately what we're doing when we're selling this information, we are selling 
everything on the screen together as one package, as our standard API package. But then we also are selling also just some of this aggregated data for those companies that just are looking for access to some specific information um, directly from the device. So looking through here, I just wanted to do a quick highlight on what some of these are. On the value add side, under battery, smart battery health relates back into that remaining useful life that I talked about previously. It gives you how many days remaining useful life are expected. And then there's some categories, zero to 30 days, 30 to 60, 90 to uh, 120. And then I believe 180 and higher is um, uh, just means that you know, there's a long extended time uh, beyond that. You know, critical battery events is really helping to identify when there have been some issues with the battery that need to be taken into account. Um, in terms of the device side, this is really looking at that fleet. What do you have? What's in use? And where are they? So the total devices, how many total devices are there? which ones are used, unused, offline, et cetera, and how long they've been offline. And then those out of contact, uh, that even gets into some of the location around them so that you can help prevent loss of those devices. You can look at um, either a GPS location or for inside the four walls, uh, uh, an access point friendly name of where it was last seen so that it can be located. Utilization, um, I, you know, I think application analytics is pretty self-explanatory. Um, device baseline analytics allows you to compare the performance of one device to an aggregate or average across a fleet. So you can identify outlying performance. And then on the far right, uh, this is information that's uh, a little, it's not focused in on the health and usage of the device, but it's looking more at the support contracts. Entitlement is what type of contract do you have, as well as the timing of that contract. Case and repair life cycle, I already showed some of that repair information. Case life cycle is similar for support cases. So I, giving people that opportunity to really identify what they have, where it's at. And, and these are information that comes from our Zebra One Care, uh, which is the service contract information and allowing people to pull that in from that API perspective. When we look down at the aggregated data level, this is really looking more, that's the direct uh, information straight off of the device. So as I explained before, we're looking at battery events, charging, discharging, um, battery status, uh, similar, uh, around how many times it's been charged, and then that information we use in the algorithms up here. Uh, however, there's a lot of great information included in these, particularly, um, I think the device is great because it gives you, you know, your make, model, serial number, Android level, uh, SDK level, et cetera. Uh, there's, I believe, over 20 different data points in there. Installed applications gives you your package, your version number, uh, et cetera, so that you can not only verify that the, the applications that are installed are what you would want, but that you're at the proper version numbers. And then utilization, these are uh, really more looking at how the devices are being used. Um, so if you're having applications that are run, having errors, uh, usage of those applications, devices that are rebooting, whether it's a system or user initiated reboot, and then how often the screen is on to be interfaced with around utilization. So ultimately, uh, this one's a little bit of an eye chart. Uh, there's a, a full chart around every one of the Visibility IQ reports, uh, as well as the APIs. Uh, but you know, when I mentioned that there's 26 different reports for VIQ, and we today have, <coughs> excuse me, nine of them reflected in the APIs. This is trying to look at what you have through that. Um, and I think a few things also to highlight on this are that the way that we're packaging this and selling this. So Visibility IQ One Care is a uh, UI that our partners and customers get when they have a service contract with Zebra. This is something that comes for free 
uh, as a benefit, or it's actually a benefit of that one care contract. When a customer or a partner buys Foresight, they're getting additional information around the device, the health, the utilization of it. And so you know, we're still offering that for sale, but we're now also offering these APIs. And these APIs can be purchased uh, on their own as a standalone offer, or they can be purchased in conjunction with Foresight. So those are different options that we have there. And kind of showcasing how we're doing that. So again, there's a bundle where you can buy the two together. You can purchase the user interface only. You can purchase the API only. And again, I, sh I show we have those two tiers. We are selling this in three and five year contracts uh, and we have them uh, some renewals through that. So for those looking to purchase that, that's the model we're using. Um, these will be added into Zebra's solution pathway for our partner community to be able to work with that. Um, I think by the end of this week, we're expecting that to be in there. Um, also, if you are wanting to learn more about this, you can go to developer.zebra.com slash APIs, uh, where we have all of our data service and API products. There's also, there's a specific tile focused exclusively just on this visibility IQ APIs. And um, I do have a link directly to, to that uh, later. And I think Pavan's probably gonna pull that screen up to show people in the developer portal. I think one other thing that I do wanna note here is that you know I've mentioned that ZDS agent that we have on the devices that uh, collects the data to help power the system. So we do require that that agent be turned on so that we can collect the data. However, we do have um, other methodologies where we can pull in some additional data by working with companies' EMMs. So if you are a SODI, AirWatch, mobile iron or 42 gears customer we can connect with that system and pull in additional data that helps augment uh, some of the information that we're pulling in and um, if you do end up looking at the SKUs that we have for sale you'll see that there's a whole host of SKUs because we have those uh, different versions we call them our connect versions so that you can uh, use those systems to, to power additional data so I'm, I'm just about done on kind of the business overview before I turn it over to Pavan, but I did want to highlight two different uh, companies that we are actively working with. One is eLocker. It's a company out of the UK that has a smart locker system. So I mentioned loss prevention. Uh, loss of devices is a very large problem for a number of our enterprise customers. And eLocker offers a solution that allows um, the customers to deploy any type of locker and then put on a smart lock onto that locker system. And then they have a, uh, a user interface that allows management of those lockers, of the devices through them, and the user interface and user management as well. That way they can identify which users are working with which um, devices and there's more accountability that way to re, uh, reduce that, um, that loss prevention. So what we're doing is we're working with eLocker and helping them identify first off, what device do they have in that locker? So that's through our device information API. Uh, they're also, they've identified that one of the biggest reasons for loss, um, it, it's that a lot of workers take a device that has a good battery and they tend to hide that device because it's the good one it's the one they want to use and by having a system like this they're able to manage that more effectively but they're also pulling in that battery information into the system so that they can more effectively manage those batteries so that all workers can have strong batteries and strong performance so they can reduce that issue of good devices versus bad devices and put everyone on that level playing field. And so that's a great use case. Um, and eLocker is really seeing a lot of uptick in their sales. Uh, and this is something that their customers are seeing significant benefits by deploying this type of solution. So another common issue that we've had 
is when we look at repair. So when you have a large deployment of devices, uh, you have a lot of workers that they're not necessarily specialists in that device. And when they run into an issue, they don't have IT on site to be able to help diagnose and address that. And so devices end up getting sent in for repair. And when uh, the repair team doesn't see an issue, we call that a no fault found and we send those devices back. Well, as you can imagine, that creates multiple problems. So there's um, disruption uh, in worker efficiency issues because they're working with devices that aren't working well. They're having to send those devices in and then they're either without a device or a replacement device has been sent back and they need to get that set up and et cetera. The other side is that there's actually shipping costs and time uh, sent on Zebra side and with our repair partners. And so what we've worked on with, uh, we're working on with a, a managed service provider is to identify the devices that are being used. And what we found is that one of the biggest things to help reduce this is just verifying first off the operating system. Is the operating system up to the latest version for that model? And, and then working through the EMM to trigger updates to those OSs so that we can reduce that. The other part is on the software apps to make sure that they're updated and can go through. And then we can kind of start walking through some of the other issues that are going on on that device to help troubleshoot it, uh, as well as uh, reduce some of these issues, sometimes even proactively addressing these things so that those workers never encounter those issues. So those are a few different examples of you know, what we have, some of those challenges, and how we're solving them through these APIs. Um, if you do wanna see these, play around with them, they are on the developer portal. So I guess I have the link here. So developer.zebra.com slash APIs slash visibility IQ. Uh, so go over there, look at them. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this over to Pavan so that he can start doing a deep dive and walk through some of the performance. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, flipping over to you, Pavan, for presenting. We should be good to go. Um, just wanna make sure you're able to see my screen. We can. And your cursor moving, so we're all good. <laughs> okay, good. All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Pavan Kumar. I am a, an architect on the team that is behind Visibility IQ Foresight and the APIs. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few things and then we'll dive into them. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about real quick about Visibility IQ Foresight and the APIs and then the steps that we need before we can start using the APIs and then uh, I'll go to the demo. Uh, you've seen this screenshot in Dan's slides as well. So uh, visibility IQ foresight is the user interface uh, used for looking at visibility IQ data and reports. Even though it's called foresight, it also includes the one care reports. Uh, if you have the foresight contract, you also have access to one care, but if you have only one care, a uh, contract, you will only have access to one care reports, but the application is the same. It's still called Visibility IQ Foresight. Um, when you log in, you see a dashboard, which is a summary information of various reports. This is just showing six of them, uh, but there are more. And once you get into the reports, like Dan showed, uh, you can see there, there can be charts and underneath there's the grid and the grids have data. And the particular one I'm showing here is the report life cycle, same as what Dan was showing. And in the in a repair life cycle, a repair goes through these different states. You know, initially there's an order open, then it's expected at the repair depot. When it gets to the repair depot, then repair starts on it, then it goes into in repair. Once it has been repaired, then it goes into the repaired state, and once it's been shipped, uh, it's in the ship state. And there's also 
Some customers have access to a spare pool depending on their entitlement. Uh, these different tabs show set of data for devices in these different states. Uh, and on the UI, you see this grid, you're able to interact with these columns, you can sort and filter them. Uh, you, you're able to do similar kind of things through the API. So the current set of APIs are pretty much exposing the same data that you're seeing in the grid uh, through the APIs. Um, as far as using it, uh, the report, I already mentioned the report grid data is being presented through these APIs. Uh, the public documentation is available on developer portal, which is which includes the specs. I sh I'm showing six of these here, but if we go over here, this is how it looks. Uh, there is some overview information here and links for various things about using APIs at Zebra. There are some videos here. And then these are the specs for each of the APIs. If you go into repair lifecycle, for example. So Pavan, I, I do want to also point out on the previous page, there's a link to a presentation deck uh, that has a lot of the content that I presented already. So if people wanted to view that, they can see that there. Yeah, great. Uh, so for each of these APIs, you will see a spec page here. That's the API version, and this is the the open API spec version that we're using for documenting these APIs. This is the URL you use for hitting the repairs API. And these are the endpoints. And you can see how they match the, the tabs on the grid. So open orders is showing the over repairs in open state. Expected order are the ones that are expected at the repair depot and so on. And if I click on one of these, uh, it gives a detailed explanation of the spec, the name of the parameter, whether it's required, the type, or where it appears in, in header, for example, here. And here's the description on the right. And it talks about how it is used, what are the constraints and defaults, examples. So you have detailed information here to get started with the API. So before we can start using the APIs, uh, we need to make sure certain things are ready. The data has to be there in the system. So first step is onboarding, which requires multiple steps. And some of these are standards. If you're already a visibility IQ, foresight user, these things would already be in place, some of these. Uh, so first one is infrastructure configuration. So the device data needs to start flowing to Savannah Data Lake, that's the, the Zebra Data Lake uh, that Dan mentioned earlier. And once the data is flowing there, we need the customer, contract, and user set up within Visibility IQ. If you are going to be using the APIs, there is an additional step for authorizing uh, the API use. What that means is you get a set of credentials which are authorized to call the APIs. Without that, it's not going to work. Once that's out of the way, uh, then the work is on the developer side, whoever is going to be calling these APIs. So you are going to choose a, a client application. It could be other tools that exist, or you're going to write code or scripts, whatever you're going to use that, that, that setup you need to do. Uh, you need to do a one-time authorization with Ping. Ping is the identity provider and authentication system uh, that is used uh, with the APIs. So, and I'm going to walk through the process. Essentially, you're saying this application or tool that I'm going to be using will be using my identity that is set up and authorized within Ping. 
so it's kind of a, a linkage you might have seen something like that if you have used a, a smart tv or roku where it says go to the go to this url and enter this code and essentially that's saying i'm, I'm authorizing that application or smart tv or device to basically use my ids to pull data uh, so that's a one-time setup and once you've done that you obtain an access token uh, there's also a refresh token so you get those tokens and then you can start calling the apis with the access token if the access token expires then you you're able to get a new pair of refresh and access tokens using the last refresh token that you have and then while that token is valid you can keep using the same access token for calling the apis over and over again you still have to pass the api key with each call and that helps the system identify uh, who is calling and be able to do metrics and billing and other kind of checks on the api requests Um, for the demo, I'm going to be using Postman. It's a popular visual tool for calling the APIs. And the example I'm going to use is uh, Repair Lifecycle, the one that we've been using uh, on other slides. Okay, so we can dive right into the demo. And this is how Postman looks like for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Uh, what it lets you do is it lets you organize uh, your requests so each request meaning a, an endpoint you're calling any of the parameters that you're going to be passing you can save those and rerun those over and over so i have a collection here which shows the the various endpoints for so this one is for creating the device code. This is the, the first time uh, that you do. You can use that for this call. And then what happens, and I'm gonna show it right here. Okay, I make that call. And what's not shown here is the, the credentials that I'm passing. So once you are authorized, you get a pair of credentials and you can set them up, set them up in Postman and uh, the first time I'm going to do this, I'm getting a device code. And I need to authorize this device code to be associated with my identity. So I can take this URL that is provided and I open it in a browser. It takes me to ping for authorization. And once I log in, that code is, has been passed and I say confirm and it says, I'm going to be associating this device code with your ID and I'm saying allow. So this is a one-time step. And once this is done, now this code has been authorized. And I can do some automation within Postman so that I'm, I don't have to manually copy paste stuff here. Um, so I'm doing that. So the information I got back in the response, this device code is already saved in my environment. The next thing I'm going to be doing is I'm taking this, this uh, the device code that I got, and I'm going to be, so it's just being passed here as a parameter. So that device code I'm sending, and I'm saying, give me a refresh token and an access token. And I do it one time only with the device code. Later on, I can just use the refresh token to get this pair again. again. So I got an access token here and a refresh token. And again, these got saved in my environment, which I called here production. And now I can go and start making any of my API calls. So let's say I'm looking for open repair orders. So again, I've kind of parameterized these, but essentially it's the URL. It will become the URL that's being shown at the top here, that URL. And I can pass various parameters. Some are some of the things I have to pass. Um, for example, it is it, the company name, the partner name, those are identifying which customer's data I am retrieving 
there's a date range, start date time and end date time, the period within which I want to retrieve this uh, data. I can specify a sort order. So I'm saying, okay, I want ascending, uh, the, the ad, sorry, the attribute is received model and order is ascending. So in the response, I want it sorted by ascending on the received model. Uh, I can also filter on a field like that. So I'm saying that I only want to see data for device type mobile. Uh, I can pass all of that. These are all header parameters. There's also the, uh, the request parameters or query parameters. These are used for pagination. So I'm saying starting from the beginning of set zero, uh, give me 20 results. And when I run that, I get a response back. And the response has the standard structure. So status 200, that's just the HTTP status. Uh, meta information saying there are total 95 results that match your query. What you are getting right now is the starting from zero offset means starting from the beginning, the first 20 results. There's also a unique request ID that is returned and this is essentially used for troubleshooting. So for example, if you had a problem, maybe the data didn't look right or there was some other issue and you open a case to for us to troubleshoot, then this is helpful for us to find and trace information uh, and troubleshoot for this particular request in our system. It also provides you links for pagination uh, so if I'm, I'm looking here from zero to 20, but if I wanna see the next set of 20, next page, I can use this link, which is saying starting 20, give me the next one, right? So if you're implementing some sort of UI to navigate back and forth, uh, you could use these uh, as helpful links so that you don't have to build these links. The, the API is providing you that. And then the data is an array of records, uh, which here show various fields. So record date has information about this record, uh, when, where the, the timestamp for the hour or the day to which this belongs. Received model is what is the model for the device that was received. RMA is repair number when it was opened, um, the address where it was delivered, what store it was delivered to. So all these fields uh, pretty much map the fields that you see on the grid in the report. Okay, so this is essentially how you use it. Once your token expires, uh, so you, you're gonna get an error for expired token. When that happens, then you can use this user token API and you pass in the current refresh token and it can issue you a new pair of access token and refresh token. And so you, you need to hang on to this refresh token because the next time when the access token expires and you want to get a new pair of access and refresh token, you're going to need the last refresh token that you got. So that way you don't need to go through that whole setup process that I showed earlier. Uh, so you do that one time and after that, as long as you can keep hold of that refresh token, you can always get a new pair of access and refresh tokens should the access token expire. Um, that is pretty much what I have for the demo. I think we can use some time for answering any questions if there are. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. Um, we do have a couple from Martin. Um, what, the first is, we use e-bonding APIs today. Will those APIs be merged into Visibility IQ or continue to be separate? 
So on that side, that's something we're evaluating. Uh, we're evaluating the most effective way to continue on with the e-bonding strategy. Um, so we don't have an answer yet for the for that, um, but that's something we're evaluating to help make it easier uh, for more of our partners and customers to have access to e-bonding as well as providing more features and functionality. Okay. And um, can you share the Postman collection with the, the crowd today? Um, we will, not exactly what I have, but yeah, we can share a collection that they can use to build the others. Okay, and, and we can something post. Coming. Can we put that on the Zebra GitHub site so that it's up there and we can share that out? Sure. And if you put it on GitHub, um, just everybody in the audience know that we can go ahead and post that link um, on the Zebra developer portal on the blog uh, discussing this dev talk. So we'll have that. We'll have a copy of the presentation and um, the YouTube video when it becomes available in the next seven to 10 days, along with uh, having that up on our YouTube playlist, which Martin had asked a, a link for and I posted to the group. Okay. Are there any other questions? Those were the only few questions that we had today. Giving it just another minute. Okay, uh, here, here we go. Sean has something. Um, how does the API work with non-Zebra devices? We have a, a variety of customers with uh, multiple devices. So these APIs are designed to work with Zebra devices only uh, right now. So that, that's the, the limit of the scope. Zebra, today it's Zebra Android mobile computers. And uh, you'll see next year we're working to make sure we can add in some functionality around uh, some of the, the Zebra printers as well. Uh, but today it's a Zebra only focus. Okay. Okay. Uh, Todd just said thank you as a couple others did for the great information and a really great presentation. I would agree and um, oh, let's see, Martin has another question. Um, are all the APIs fully available and functional today? So they, this is, uh, you know, I said earlier uh, in Solutions Pathway, it's not quite there. We're working through the last test to make sure our full onboarding process is working. The APIs are fully functional. We're also working on getting our demo environment set up. But if there, if this is something you're interested in, you know, I expect by the end of the week, we're gonna have these out in sellable as well as have that demo environment up. So if you are interested, please either reach out directly to me or work through your Zebra account manager and we can work to uh, start getting people access. Okay, and we can post some, some links to the availability too um, for people. Uh, happy to do that for this team as well. Um, is the ZPC agent, George is asking, is the ZPC agent available on all LinkOS printers? Yes, yes it is. So that ZPC agent has been on LinkOS printers for a number of years now. Um, when enabled, that actively sends data up to Zebra Savannah. Uh, and so we have had the ability to collect that data for a while. We just have not uh, built out access to that for the customers and partners yet. So that's something that we are working on, um, uh, but yeah. Okay, Havoc is asking, can you give a brief, brief information on the printer agent? Um, the, not sure. let's see, I'm, I'm not a super expert on the agent. So I know on the mobile computer side, we're pulling 250 different data points on the printer side. It's more limited. Um, I'm not, you know, on, on the printer, we have well over a thousand different data points that can be accessed. Those are not all being pulled through that agent. Um, you know, it's a subset of those. And I, I don't want to say anything incorrect. Uh, so I'm not gonna say how many of them there are just because I'm not remembering right now. Um, 
but that is something uh, you know. My understanding is it's it's it can be managed uh, separate from the the operating system or the firmware, and uh, and then you know I think that it's you know using some standard ports to be able to send that data up to Zebra Savannah just like the uh, ZDS agent. But I'm not as much of an expert on that one. So. Cool. And uh, William is asking, which maybe you can address for the crowd. Um, they wanted to get insight as to what APIs a developer can integrate now at free of cost. And, and I think that addressing the price of other APIs, how would you address that? Yeah, so um, you know, the, that three tiers that I was showing, when we look at direct integration with the device through our EMDKs, um, that, that today is all free. Uh, so that allows a user to interface with the device in whatever method that they want. When we're looking at Zebra hosting information and collecting it, like we're doing with that ZDS agent and through Zebra Savannah, uh, because there's costs associated with us pulling that data, hosting it, and then uh, giving access to it through our cloud system, Zebra Savannah, that, that's when there are costs associated with it. So that's some of the, uh, the difference in those approaches. And then as we kind of move up that tier, it was something like Visibility IQ, where we're, we have some uh, unique algorithms uh, giving unique insights that there's, there's more value associated with those as well. Okay. Um, it looks like our last question of the day here today um, from Steve, what is the volume of data sent from the device and how frequently does it happen? Um, I am forgetting the exact size of the payload. I did see some great statistics um, where uh, we, in the latest version of the ZDS agent, we have significantly cut down on the amount of data that's sent as well as the impact on battery life so that it's, it's quite negligible. Um, but I, I don't remember the exact packet size. In terms of the frequency, um, that is something that we can set. So by default, it's once every 24 hours. Um, so this is actually something I, I wish I had highlighted earlier. So when we look at different types of use cases, this is near real time. So by default, it's once every 24 hours, but we can update that to be as frequently as every 30 minutes. Um, at the same time, even when that data is updated every 30 minutes, it needs to be ingested into the system and there are some, there's some processing that goes on. So we would say roughly every couple of hours um, that you would have access to that latest data. Um, so if you are trying to in real time track where something is, that's not quite the right use case. If you're trying to look at historical records and patterns and trends and near real time con, uh, conclusions, that's where this uh, this system is set up to to run well. Okay. Um, and I, this will be our final question of the day: Is the update timing for all the data collected, or can you control how frequently individual data points are uploaded? That's from Daniel. So, so we received um stage now barcode uh to set those configurations and we have them in if i remember correctly 30 minute one hour two hour four hour six eight you know 10 uh, 12 24 something like that so it you can't um set you know anything but we we have a, a variety from that 30 minutes up to the 24 hours um, I want to add uh, real quick. Uh, even though the devices may be set up to send data every hour or every day, you know, whatever frequency it is, the devices are not synchronized. So each device can be sending data at any point in the day. Uh, what Visibility IQ does is every hour it looks at whatever device is reported within that hour and then it pulls that data in and it becomes available. That's a good good clarifier, because okay. especially, you know, we have some customers with 
tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of devices. And so to understand how that the synchronizing and all that works is important. All right. I think that wraps it up today. Thank you so much.